All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the forum webinar series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Priya Chaya, and I am the Associate Director of Content here at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In case you don't know, Preservation Leadership Forum is the professional membership program of the National Trust. This webinar series is made possible by members of Preservation Leadership Forum, and we sincerely thank everyone who is joining us today. Today's webinar is called From Concept to Reality, Preservation Project Planning Basics. Um, and we'll give an overview of the process of architectural design and construction practiced by architects, engineers, contractors, and preservationists, which provides the framework for more, most rehabilitation projects. But first, a couple of logistical things. We will take questions from the audience during the webinar. Instead of using the chat to ask your question, please use the Q&A box at the in the sort of the black bar at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Um, you're welcome to talk to each other in the chat during the webinar as well, but we will only be answering questions that are submitted via the Q&A panel. The closed captioning function has been enabled. Um, and you can, using the black bar at the bottom, you can enable it or stop it as you will. And following the program, we'll send out a recording of today's webinar directly to the email you use to register. And finally, all forum webinars are archived in our forum webinar library. And one more thing that I forgot to mention, we'll be answering questions from the audience at the end of the webinar, but you can feel free to ask them at any point during the actual conversation. And now I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Olivia Terraconi, the preservation architect for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Hey, Olivia. Hello. Hi, everyone. Okay, so that's me. <laughs> we'll get started here. Um, a lot to cover, but today's webinar, like Priya said, is to help you get started on the process of taking your building from your building rehabilitation project from concept to reality. So perhaps you're completely new to the process, or perhaps you're looking for a refresher and some new tips, or perhaps you're a seasoned architect or construction professional who would like to give me some tips afterwards. You are all welcome, and thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Um, the process I'll describe, the process of design and construction, is practiced, um, as Priya said, by architects, engineers, contractors, and preservationists, and provides the framework for most rehab projects, but also for most new construction projects as well. Next slide, please. So a little bit on my background so you know my perspective and where I'm coming from with everything that I'll be telling you today. I'm a registered architect, registered in the state of Pennsylvania, which is where I began my career and education. I'm currently located in Houston, Texas, however. I have been with the National Trust for since 2017, and I work on our National Treasures campaigns as well as the National Fund for Sacred Places. So the uh, picture you're seeing on the right there is of Nina Simone's childhood home, which is one of our National Treasure campaigns that I helped assess the building and um, prepare it for an architect to work on it, get them started on the the assessment and then the conceptualization of the rehabilitation. Um, but the perspective for pretty much everything I'll be talking about today comes from our work with the National Fund. Um, and the National Fund for Sacred Places is a very large program we do here, the National Trust, but um, Alison King will be joining us later to tell you more about that. But all you need to know about from my perspective is that each of the participants that are in the National Fund undertakes a big capital improvement project to their building. Um, so we are taking them through, through this process. Um, so when I'm working with technical assistance with the National Fund participants, I'm helping them write RFPs, hire design professionals, communicate with their architects and contractors, um, and then in the end, reviewing their documents when they apply for their actual grant funds. Um, but today, everything we talk about should be general enough that you can apply it to any building of any scale. No small task. So next slide, please. The design and construction process um, is going, getting you from concept to reality. So it's getting your idea into using the space, taking your program and making the space right for it, making the space that can contain it and making drawings that turn into the material reality, the design to the construction. Next slide, please. So this process is, is well-established. It is 
mostly consistently applied. And it really is, is a framework. And the, the framework is important. And I, I hope you all can come out of this understanding a little bit about the framework so that you can navigate within that framework. Um, it is a standardized framework. Um, we learn about it as architects when we are applying for our licensure through our tests. Um, and there are many resources to help you about it. The AIA is a good one. AIA is not our licensing body. We're licensed by the state, but by each state. But um, you can definitely use the AIA, the American Institute of Architects website for resources on the process, as well as contracts, which I will refer to, refer to later a little bit. Um, but of note, and why we're all here on Preservation Leadership Forum, is that preservation projects actually take an added layer to this process because they require some variation, and that variation happens on the front end. Because starting from an existing building is different than starting a new construction, and starting a uh, starting a project with a significant existing building is an even an, an additional layer. So we will be talking about that layer and making sure that you understand the difference between the traditional project process and of a project and the um, preservation version of it so you can help advocate for your historic building. Um, we have created for you a checklist, a resource. Priya, looks like she just linked it, thank you. It is um, by no means a, a Bible to how to do this, but it is a, a resource to look to as a reference for how, when you're going through a project, um, I call it a checklist, but it's really just an outline of this presentation today in the one page front and back kind of form. It'll be linked in the webinar as well, at the end. Um, so next slide. Before we get into design and construction, I do wanna just give a very brief preservation overview. I'm gonna to try to you know, tell you all about the entire preservation field in two, sl three slides. Um, but for those of you that may have a historic building and haven't really interacted with, with the preservation infrastructure that much, there is a lot to learn and a lot of nuance. So I'm gonna keep it as general as possible. But basically when we approach, when preservationists approach a building, there are four treatments they're approaching it with. Um, so it's kind of like, what do we do in preservation? We apply these one of these four treatments to a building, um, preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, reconstruction. Um, preservation is under, it's a little confusing, but as a treatment, it's simply a sustaining the existing form as is, no updates, um, no, every change over time is maintained. You maybe make a couple updates for building code compliance and, and um, stability of the building. Uh, rehabilitation, on the other hand, is improving the building to make possible a compatible use. So you're preserving the historic character, but you're also bringing it back into active use. Um, for potentially a different use than it was originally intended, but it's compatible. Restoration is taking a building back to another time, a period of significance, and it's stripping away all other periods. So it's very specific to a time. And reconstruction is a new construction, actually, but it is accurately replicating a non-surviving structure. So these treatments are outlined by the Secretary of the Interior, which we'll talk about in a sec but it's basically the philosophy for approaching a building. But within that, there are many different pieces to a building. Perhaps you're going to restore a window or restore a banister, but you're not restoring the entire building in a restoration. You're probably doing a rehabilitation. And the design and construction process at its core is about improving and changing a building. So for the context of the rest of this webinar, for the most part, I will be talking about rehabilitations. Next slide. Now, that's what we do in preservation at the highest level, and this is who you deal with. So there are a lot of people practicing preservation. There are, this is a chart that has helped me since I've been in preservation um, as an architect and thought it'd be helpful for people who aren't familiar, but we have regulatory governmental agencies and we have advocacy and private nonprofits. And then it, they have each of those different types of organizations at the national, state, and local level. So we at the National Trust are the private nonprofit at a national level. And an example of another org that does this national work would be Preservation Action. And we are the nonprofit 
private counterparts to the government's national organization that's enforcing the National Preservation Act um, is the National Park Service, which is a part of the Department of the Interior. State level, we have, for the regulatory, we have the State Historic Preservation Office, goes by many different names, so check, make sure you know what yours is here in Texas. Ours is the Texas Historical Commission. Um, other places, we'll just call it the State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO. And then you might have a statewide nonprofit. In most states we do, here in Texas, we have Preservation Texas. So it's a nonprofit, not regulating anything, but here to advocate for preservation on a statewide level. And then at the local level, depending on the ordinance of your city or town, you might have a preservation officer and a local preservation commission of some sort that actually is regulating the physical changes to your building. So this is the local level is of note to you as a person doing a design and construction process project on a building. And you probably also have a local or a few, many different types and, and interests, local nonprofits that can be useful as you embark on your project as well. So next slide. So how we do it, the Secretary of Interior Standards is, um, and the guidelines said best on their website. So this is held by the National Park Service and part of the Department of Interior. It is common sense historic preservation principles in non-technical language. Um, they are to promote the historic preservation best practices that will help protect our nation's irreplaceable cultural resources. It's a set of pretty um, layman's terms, almost uh, standards listed in words that can be interpreted very differently, but luckily they also provide a super detailed booklet of guidelines. So check out the NPS website. These are what govern how we do a lot of our work um, and very important to the field and to your work going forward on your building. Okay, next slide, back to your building and your project. So you're here to learn general best practices for preservation project planning. And I like to start with these three sort of overarching best practice principles. So before you go out and hire anybody, start internally. Look, look within, decide what are your internal priorities for your building? What, why are we changing our building? Perhaps it's just a, a deferred maintenance project, or perhaps it's we want to change how we function overall, how this building is positioned in its community in the world. Um, it's best to figure that kind of stuff out before you hire someone so that you can best use their services. Um, and then I recommend memorializing those priorities in some sort of internal priorities document or something you keep around so that you can always kind of check back with yourself. Next, I would say look for preservation or look for professionals experienced in historic preservation. And that goes for architects, contractors, engineers, and anybody who's gonna to be touching or designing your building. It's, it's a different, a unique set of circumstances required that are that exist with historic buildings. And so it requires a unique set of professionals. So you wanna check their qualifications and references. And just remember a good architect may not be the right architect for your project. So the architect who designed the amazing industrial rehab into a shopping center in your town or city might not be the best person to do the design for the restoration of a historic house museum with Victorian details. And same thing goes for a contractor who might be fantastic to work with on a new house or a kitchen renovation. But if they've never worked with a historic building before, they can really truly do more harm than good. Um, so check qualifications. And lastly, make very thorough plans before you touch your building, before you change it. Undoing a physical change to your building can be irreversible or extremely, extremely expensive to reverse. So a wrong decision could end up impacting future historic designations or current or funding sources from related to that. So it's not to, meant to scare you from proceeding. It's meant to just scare you away from someone who walks in and says, okay, let's go, let's get started. If they walk in with a hammer, ask them to put it down and say, let's talk about what the design is first before we proceed. Okay, next slide. So the process that I'm talking about, the design and construction process is usually talked about in terms of design bid build. 
but the overlay of historic preservation um, is that we want to add an assess part beforehand. So the assessing is when you begin with diagnostics, begin with diagnosing your building, and we would call that the pre-design or diagnostics phase. The gray on the right um, will relate you back to the checklist of that pre-ascent. Um, so after we do, after we assess, we design, we create a roadmap for how to proceed. Then we bid the project where we pick the team who's actually going to alter the building. And then we build, we implement that plan. Next slide. So begin with diagnostics. The metaphor for the diagnostics uh, and the pre-design phase I like is of a, a building x-ray. And this photo is fantastic. I uh, wish I knew where it came from, sorry credit internet, but a building assessment is like an x-ray for your building because doing a construction pro project on your building is like doing a surgery. And I don't think any of us would like someone to open up their chest without doing the appropriate amount of diagnostic testing, like MRI, CAT scan, whatever they need to make sure that we're going in, we're doing the right surgery for the right project. Um, and you can then proceed from there with a relatively low investment compared to the rest of the process with confidence that you're doing the right thing for your building. So the example that I like to pro provide here was given to me by another architect. And he was telling me how he had a church come to him and say, we wanna replace the roof. There's a leak, we see it in the ceiling of a sanctuary. And he said, hold on, before we just replace the roof, let's assess and figure out why the leak is there. Lo and behold, the roof was totally fine. It was an HVAC unit in an adjacent attic leaking. So replacing the roof, if they had just decided to call a contractor and replace the roof, all of that would have been a waste and the leak would have continued. So that is why we assess. Next is, oh, the a building assessment is sort of the tool for assessment. So we encourage every congregation that we work with to commission an, an official holistic building assessment report and the checklist will give you more details on what to include in those types of things, but they have lots of different names, like a condition assessment, an HSR, a feasibility study, a master plan. Um, but the intention of an assessment report is to find the sources of your issues and then provide prioritized recommendations for how to proceed. So ultimately giving you a path of, of option of how to proceed forward in a way that is, um, prioritized and you can choose then with how to proceed to, with the actual work. Next. So the design phase is essentially creating the roadmap for how to proceed. You know where you're going after you've done the assessment phase. Um, you know what kind of what your end game is, but it takes a lot to get there because buildings are full of so many complicated and interconnected systems. And you wanna make sure that you're getting the quickest route there, that you've got like the Google Maps algorithm going for traffic, right? You wanna make sure that you are getting there as quickly and efficiently as possible. And it's critical to do a detailed, a detailed map, essentially. And it takes some time. And this is where your architect comes in. Um, a contractor who says, okay, I see your feasibility report or I see your condition assessment, I'll just do the work. It's kind of like hiring someone to drive a car who can't read, who didn't make a map. They can probably they can read a map, obviously. But they, you just, they just need to be provided with it. But it would be like asking them to follow the North Star. You really want to give very detailed directions. And that is the architectural design part of this process. Next slide. The shortest, but also very important part of this is the bidding phase where we pick the team. So just, uh, it's kind of a plug for competitive bidding, making sure you're getting multiple prices for the same scope of work and um, hiring a team captain to pick the team from your side as the owner, which could be a project manager internally or you hire someone else, but make sure you get the best team you can like the Women's World Cup team from a few years ago. Um, next slide. Last, we implement the plan. So construction like tattoos is not easily reversed, uh, especially for historic buildings. Um, so don't skip steps along the way and you will have no regrets and your tattoo will look 
nice and be spelled correctly and nothing will have to go back and be undone. So now next slide on to the details. If that wasn't enough, this is a animated slide. So Rhonda's just gonna click through all of them for me. Thank you. Um, so we've got the design bid build process. And within that, there are smaller pieces. Um, so pre-design, SD, DD, DD, CDs, bid, CA, operation. Pre-design is the concept, kind of the formation of project basics. And oh, I'm just, I'm talking about the traditional version right now. I'm gonna do a historic preserve preservation overlay in the next slide. Schematic design is where we have the creative big picture concepts and then your architect will come to you for approvals and then go back and design more in design development. And this is where we start defining building systems, your structure, your mechanical, what are they gonna look like? And then we get to construction documents, which is where the architect puts their head down and designs all the tiny little details along the way. And this takes a while and they, your architect will disappear for a little bit of time and come back to you with a lot of paper and that's the that's your roadmap that they're making and then bidding and negotiation and construction administration also these are the roles of the architect um, they can help you do the bidding and they can also be hired for construction administration um, to help make sure it's the building the work is done and built according to their plans um, yep that next slide so the Oh yeah, sorry, we'll go through a little bubbles. Um, the overlay in the next slide with historic preservation is to really expand that pre-design phase. So it's essentially the assess that I was telling you when we were adding. And it's the diagnostics we're doing and possibly a stabilization phase where you've diagnosed your, prop, your building and you know where you wanna go, but there's some urgent stabilization work that needs to happen so you can do that sort of parallel to your, your regular design phase and construct it, construct meaning stabilize your building while you're working on the design for the rehabilitation and improvements. Um, so all this to say preservation is just much heavier on the pre-design work and there's the stabilization phase parallel possibility. Um, next. So each of these pieces are have associated deliverables and the pre-design um, assessment phase has many different options. So these are gonna depend on what you need for your building. And like I was saying before, there's many different names. Um, so without preservation, you might be doing a real estate feasibility study, programming and use study, concept like over designing the form or evaluating the site for where you can actually put things on the piece of property you're working with. And then in preservation, you're assessing the condition, you can do a conditions assessment of the building itself, historic structures report to do a lot more about the building um, in its history and many other aspects. And then zoning and code review can be important before you even start a project just to make sure it's feasible and many, many more options. And then at each step in the design process, there's also a set of drawings and specifications until you get to your final, your bid documents. Um, so lots of jargon here, but just some words to know that can be and will be thrown around during this process. Next page. So who, who does what? Um, I kind of referred to it, but always worth defining. But the architect's job is on the design side. And it's to perform a building assessment, then do the design. Um, can be separate contracts. We actually recommend doing them as separate contracts. So you can have some time to pause and reflect in between. And the design is then translated into the manual for construction, which is your construction documents, which once we sign into a bid with a contractor become contract, you know, the part of the contract and the contractor is contractually obliged to do it the way that it was drawn. Um, and then, Number four, ensure the building is constructed as designed. This is the construction administration task I was talking about before. You have to add that on. It's not always a service. Um, just make sure that your contract with your architect is inclusive of that um, if you would like. And the contractor's job is different than that. It is to provide a price or bid for the scope of work outlined in the design documents and construct the project according to those documents. I tell you all of these things because it's just when there are variations from these very typical roles is when 
you should just take a moment, step back and reflect. So a contractor may try to come in earlier and they often will and provide estimates. And if they would like to do that, that is extremely helpful. Um, you can also hire independent uh, cost estimators via your architectural contract. But I don't recommend hiring a contractor until after you've done a competitive bidding process. So just because someone's giving you estimates doesn't mean you're beholden to hiring them and um, just making sure that you're, you're trying to get the best price possible. So next slide shows you just at each phase in the process who, who's, who we recommend in this traditional process you are working with. So um, the architect is there for the design portion and the contractor is there for the bid and the build. Um, just remembering that because the, the lines can get blurry because there's so many steps, but these are the, again, the framework. Um, let's see. So the next slide is just showing you sort of the organizational chart of the relationships and who's paying who. So you as the owner are paying the architect and the contractor, but they are not tied to each other contractually, the architect and the contractor. So you're hiring the architect um, for the building assessment, like I said, and then later separately, subsequently, or maybe all in one for the design itself. Um, the architect will then hire sub consultants. So this is where your structural engineer, your mechanical engineer, electrical plumbing, fire protection, landscape, plus I have on there, code, cost, lighting, lots of different sub consultants. These are all people who are designing each of the different systems, but the architect is the one coordinating them and sub consulting to them. So you are paying the architect and they are paying their sub consultants. The owner may have a set of consultants on their own. And these are people that the architect maybe is not willing or wanting to coordinate, or maybe it's just somebody that is you are closer with as the owner. So examples of that are, or, or it's also things that don't need to be coordinated, like a geotechnical or a site survey that it's not going to change. You just kind of are hiring it out and then it's a done deal. Um, so examples of that are geotechnical, hazardous materials, survey, audiovisual. Uh, next slide when to hire a contractor. So it's after the construction documents have been completed by the architect and we put out information to bid and you've received multiple bids that you can then compare and review. Um, and again, if contractors would like to be involved earlier, totally fine, but just not committing to them until we're competitively bidding. Um, general parting words. So believe it or not, this is my last slide, but then we'll talk much more in, in um, concrete examples about, about all of this. But I encourage all of you in your building design and construction rehabilitation pro projects to ask a lot of questions. Don't hesitate to ask for definitions of acronyms and jargon. I'm sure I used, I know I used a lot of jargon in this presentation that may not um, have been clear, and you can definitely ask about that in the Q&A section later, but it is, you know, you are a consumer of these services by architects and engineers and contractors, and you are paying for their expertise, but you are paying for them to do the work that um, and help you understand the work that's being done as well. Um, the some words to always clarify too are like plans and drawings. You wanna know if you're referring to the official plans and drawings or the general plan for the day. Always good to clarify. Um, and always as empowering yourself to ask these questions, remember you're the one who's gonna be using this building once to practice. You're here for the life of it, um, which you're extending by doing this rehabilitation project. And your hired professionals are just there for the most part for your project at hand for what you're hiring them for. So. Continue to advocate for yourself and your building by asking questions and keep records. So the drawings or documentations or any documentation of changes to your building are useful when you go on to the next project because there's pretty much always a next project for the historic building. So you can be more ready for you or whoever comes after you to undertake those if you keep good records. Um, take photos to record the progress. Everyone loves a before and after. And also it's just fun to see how far you've come. And 
then um, the assessment reports refer back to them. So any assessment reports you had done may have outlined steps one through 10 of priorities and you were only able to carry out one, two, four, and five. Keep the report so you can go back and see if we still need to do three in five years time, et cetera. Um, so keep those on hand. They're usually kind of thick books that sit on a shelf. Just remember where they are and keep a digital copy too. And lastly, return to those internal priorities we talked about in the beginning. Reassess them, readjust as necessary after every project and after every, every shift in priorities for your building or organization. I think that is all. I hope this presentation has provided a stronger basis for you all to proceed and ask more questions. Um, I hope it, it created more questions for you as you move forward with your building projects and um, feel free to refer back to it. There'll be a copy online and then this checklist that I keep referring to that Priya linked is something good to keep around as well. So next we are going to talk a little bit about the National Fund and I introduce Allison King from Partners for Sacred Places now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia, and that was a great presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Allison King. I'm the Grants and Program Manager at Partners for Sacred Places, and I'm here today to provide some information about the National Fund program I work on with Olivia. So the National Fund is a program of Partners for Sacred Places in collaboration with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. It's graciously funded by the Lilly Endowment, a private philanthropic foundation supporting the causes of religion, education, and community development. Next slide. Thanks. So you're all very uh, likely to know the trust. So I'll tell you a little bit more about partners work um, as the National Fund is a program of Partner for Sacred Places in collaboration with the National Trust. Partners for Sacred Places was founded in 1989. It's the only non-sectarian nonprofit organization dedicated to the sound stewardship and active community use of older historic places across America. We provide capital training and fundraising strategies along with technical assistance and grants to historic houses of worship across the country. The National Fund Program is oriented to assist congregations who have assessed their buildings but need external support to locate the financial resources they need to complete their projects and move through the capital uh, campaign phase of their work. To that end, a typical National Fund Program timeline looks something like this. We announce those that are awarded entry into the program every October at which point we hit the ground running with a training program. In the past, it was in person, but due to COVID, we've moved to a virtual format for this foreseeable future. Um, we offer planning grants, which are non-matching grants of up to $5,000 to help folks produce campaign materials, construction drawings and specifications and anything else they need to really set a solid foundation for their large capital project. Um, and then when folks are ready, uh, meaning they've reached the two benchmarks for our capital grant submission stage, um, then we begin that process with them, which means they've raised a quarter of their matching funds and have permit ready drawings, um, which our team reviews and approve, at which point the first half of the grant award is dispersed. The second half of the grant award is awarded upon the completion of the National Fund scope of work. Timelines will vary by funder, but they're worth considering if your project requires external support. So the National Fund training is designed to help congregations successfully complete their capital projects within the two-year pro program deadline. So each cohort is provided free training that covers project planning, crafting a fundraising plan, designing a capital campaign, making the case to stakeholders, media strategy, and more. After the training, each congregation, as I mentioned, is provided with a planning grant, but also with a specialized package of partners services tailored to best support each congregation and their needs. So technical assistance services that we provide include case statement review, communication support, capital campaign coaching, community engagement uh, services if you're looking to engage wider stakeholders, project planning or an economic halo effect study which utilizes a tool that partners develop to quantify the economic impact of a sacred place in order to better communicate their civic value. All of these steps are informed by the building conditions assessment and those pre-designed steps which is why it's key to understanding the totality of your building's issues and having a plan um, to communicate that to funders. In terms of the financial support that the National Fund provides, I've already mentioned the planning grants of up to $5,000, which are non-matching 
planning grants, and then we have our capital grant funds. So our matching challenge, um, which is a match for all of our capital grants, is designed to incentivize congregations to expand their network of stakeholders and donors and build sustainable connections that the congregation can use to provide for their community well into the future. So each congregation must match our grant dollars for the capital grants with new money raised after they're awarded entry into our program. For grants of 50 to $100,000, the match is a one-to-one. -one. Um, for larger grants of 100 to $250,000, it's a grant of two-to-one match. And so the congregation is responsible for raising $2 for every dollar that we award. Um, there's a list of typical eligible matching funds on this slide, and you can find more information about our grant eligibility process at our website, fundforsacredplaces.org. Next slide. If you are interested in applying to the grant, um, the 2022 application timeline will look similar to the 2022 application timeline here on the slide. Uh, we'll be posting the 2022 calendar later this fall, so be sure to check our website for those exact dates. We'll be opening up our letter of intent process through our online grants management system, Foundant, which you can access through our website in January. Uh, full app will be, um, the letters of intent will be due uh, towards the end of February, early March. Um, we have a two-step application process. So folks, you can go back one slide. Um, thank you. Uh, so folks um, need to get their letters of intent in by March um, 1st or by the end of February. We'll notify folks in June as to what that looks like. Um, we typically go from between 300 applicants to about 30 that we invite for a full application, which goes into a little bit more depth. Um, we confer our choices with our advisory committee meeting in September, which is after the full applications are due in July. And then we notify folks if they're awarded into the program in October. Thanks, next slide. Here's a map showing of kind of where all of our grantees have been located so far. We're hoping to expand into states that we haven't yet had grantees, including Arkansas, Colorado, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Missouri, Mississippi. You can find the whole list on our website again um, and more information about the National Fund as well. So at this point, I'd like to pass the baton to Mike Roos, who's one of our current National Fund participants from Lovely Lane United Methodist Church in Baltimore. Thanks, Allison. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I also want to thank the uh, National Trust for the opportunity of sharing our rehabilitation story at uh, Lovely Lane United Methodist. Uh, I'm a private practice architect in Washington, D.C., focusing mostly on uh, residential work with private clients and a uh, lifelong Methodist and a member at Lovely Lane for uh, almost 20 years now. Um, next slide, please. I want to give you a little bit of background about Lovely Lane. Um, we were uh, notified in October of 2019 that we had received um, an invitation to come to the National Fund training and were um, awarded a capital grant of a quarter of a million dollars, which we have uh, put to use in our project. So today's uh, presentation is to tell you a little bit about our planning process in getting to our project. Next slide, please. Lovely Lane, you can see there are three images here. Um, on the left, an exterior view of a Stanford White designed uh, church from 1887 is when it was completed. Uh, it was um, designed to be the centennial monument of the founding of the Methodist uh, denomination in the United States. Our congregation traces our roots back to um, the original 1784 uh, Christmas conference in Baltimore where Francis Asbury was elected the first bishop of the American uh, Methodist Church. Uh, the middle slide there is uh, of our sanctuary, which we in 2004 um, restored uh, back to some original paint colors and original ceiling uh, for about $2 million. So our church came to this project uh, with some experience. And then on the right is an image of um, the chapel, which is next on the list for our restoration project. Um, next slide, please. We're still an active congregation uh, in, in the same building, obviously. Um, here you can see some more images. Um, on the left there, a spiral staircase that goes to the chapel balcony and also the balcony of the congregation, or excuse me, of the sanctuary. Uh, another staircase in the middle there, same staircase, but uh, of a different view. 
And then a staircase there on the right uh, for the parsonage. Next slide, please. Some more images of uh, kind of the chapel and the building. And at this point, I want to tell you a little bit about how we got started. Um, so we started with forming a business, or excuse me, a, a building renovation task force. And the, there was about 10 members on that task force. And um, just to give you an idea of the, the talent um, that, that we had, we had two architects, myself and another mechanical engineer. Uh, the build, the uh, building task force chair was a finance person. Of course, we had the pastor, we had a lawyer, uh, we had an English teacher, which helped in the DNA study and, and catching a lot of grammatical errors. But we were all dedicated people that came together. Next slide, please. Um, that building renovation task force started in uh, August of 2017, and we, we later um, turned that into what was called the Lovely Lane 21st Century Committee after our training uh, in Chicago with the National Fund. Um, in that, we had five subcommittees, uh, communications committee to get the word out through uh, digital newsletters, emails. Um, you can actually go to the church's website and under the publication link, see a lot of the digital media that we've put out to, um, to donors and, and funding sources. We had an RFP committee, which I chaired, which was uh, in charge of hiring the architect and owner's rep and, and um, working on the design with the architect. Contracts committee um, for hiring the contractor, administrating that contract. Of course, we needed the fundraising committee all the way in the beginning because everyone needs money. And it, it really was um, a veritable public and private sector approach to the capital campaign, which uh, Jackie Noller, the um, chair and finance person um, really headed up. And then a community uh, uh, committee, which basically was to find partners in the, in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. So what we did first was had a charrette. And as an architecture student, I admit, did many of these in school. It comes from the French word for cart. You can see the uh, uh, image on the left there of architecture students uh, busily putting the final uh, ink work on their drawings as they put it on the cart to go to school. But what we did was more of a charrette of bringing um, everybody together in the church. It was, again, in that committee of 10 and talking about what we needed for our building, where we um, saw our users needing uh, in the building. User, you know, building use for us is, a, is, a, is an economic thing. It, it, it helps pay the bills. What did our building offer? Um, the, the Baltimore Sun, when the building was open, said it was one of the best acoustical spaces in the city. So we knew we had that. And this charrette was answering all those questions and placing ideas in rooms, you know, we had a, a folk dance society that met. They, they love using the um, fellowship hall. We, we had a, a, a gymnasium that was used by uh, after school group. So this charrette really allowed us as the owners to pull all our ideas together to help define the project. And we did it before the building's needs assessment, which is the next slide, please. So our, our building needs assessment, we, we turned to uh, the architect that helped us with the um, uh, sanctuary renovation, and that was Donald Kahn of Walden Studios. And he basically helped us take our charrette materials and our findings and put it into the building needs assessment. And we looked at everything, again, from HVAC, the need for air conditioning, uh, the need for bathrooms. We literally only had maybe four or five bathrooms in the whole building, and our sanctuary can hold 750 people. So um, that was definitely something that needed to be looked at. Handicap access was another huge thing. And so this building needs assessment, took all of that and also applied budgets to it, which then helped us to start planning for grants, raising money and so forth. Next slide, please. So then we did the RFP process. Um, we we uh, thanked Donald for his time in, in doing the build, building needs assessment. And we knew we wanted to interview other architects as well, because we wanted to get the best uh, out there. So I helped craft the RFP document that went out to the architects, you know, everything listed here, a project description from the BNA study, what our scope of work was, um, the schedule and budget expectations that we had as an owner. We asked for qualification statements from uh, those firms. So the resumes of the key people we'd be working with, the experiences with this type of project, asking for similar projects, and most importantly, asking for what was the budget you gave the client and what was the actual cost? 
uh, and, and what drove that difference? So that was a really important um, uh, question that needed to be answered for, for our committee. How were they gonna approach the project? Were they going to um, you know, immediately uh, pull in uh, consultants that were necessary? I mean, MEP, are we gonna work with an MEP first and then develop the design, so on and so forth? So the project approach is really important. And then you wanna ask them to recapitulate what the understanding of the project is back to you. If somebody comes back and says, well, we're, you know, we're going to put a glass cube in your chapel, they didn't understand the, the nature of the project. Next slide, please. Who's on your team? Um, we talked a little bit about this. Um, so ultimately, in the interview that we had with, with all three architects that were well qualified, we settled on Walden Studio because they really brought to the table a unique viewpoint on our project. Not only did they know the building, but um, when we did the interview, we asked to not speak to the principal. We asked to speak to the project manager in charge. And um, that really came out from our owner's rep, CapEx, uh, who I'll talk about in a moment. But the project manager brought to the table for our project was creating a community space, which is what we wanted to ultimately do, that was really like a third place. Um, Starbucks has really capital, um, capitalized on this. The notion of it's not home, it's not the office, but it's a third place you can go. So that really struck a lot of people on the committee and, and with the previous work experience, Walden was ultimately selected. Prior to that, we did engage an owner's rep, uh, CapEx Advisory, um, and they have been invaluable in helping to communicate amongst the committee, the architect, the contractors, offering guidance. I mean, we do have two architects on the, on the uh, committee, but the owner's rep really brought a lot to it. Obviously the building committee, which I've already talked about, which is the Lovely Lane 21st Century Committee, and then ultimately the contractor. And we went through the same RFP process with the contractor and the same interview process. Um, and we ultimately settled on Plano Calden to do uh, the first phase of our project. We have a multitude of phases ranging from uh, handicap ramp, air conditioning and fellowship hall to Tiffany glass restoration in, in, the, in the chapel. Next slide, please. So construction, phase 1A, there you go. There's our ramp, a uh, funny story in, in, during construction. Um, we, in order to get a legal ADA ramp, um, we had to go four inches over into our neighboring property. Funny story, the church used to own that neighboring property back in 1887. Um, John Goucher, who was the pastor, created Goucher College right around the church. Uh, but now it belonged to the uh, lab school of uh, Baltimore. And we had to have the lawyer help us, uh, as, well, as well as a surveyor, uh, write up a four inch easement agreement, believe it or not, four inches, uh, but it, it, it definitely worked. Um, and, and lab school was a partner in the community because they used our building. And we reached out during this whole process to keep them up to date. The less, um, exciting part, but to us very exciting were the bathrooms. Uh, you can see some, some images there. Um, next slide, please. And for us, it was important to celebrate uh, both in the church and outside the church. Uh, so an image here on the upper left is our district superintendent on the left and the uh, bishop of the Baltimore Washington Conference coming, um, preaching, and, and cutting the ribbon for us. Uh, and then during the church service, having uh, the building committee recognized in, in front of the congregation. So, you know, celebration is good because it, it shows everybody we're active. It shows people that um, the process is moving forward. This is just phase 1A and phase 1B is going to be coming um, pretty soon. And the next slide. So the next steps, you know, the chapel here, um, is, is ready for restoration like, like the sanctuary. You can see some of the historic windows. The Tiffany windows are, are the uh, Claire Story windows all the way at the top there, um, beautifully designed after some Roman mosaics, uh, and then some more stained glass there. So that is all um, actually phase 1B, if I remember correctly, is next, is, is the windows. Um, and then adding air conditioning to our fellowship hall to increase uh, building use and for our own use. Um, and then, then ultimately, really, we as a congregation take seriously um, the nature of being stewards for this building. And so through this process, we've, uh, we've been able to do that. 
Um, I just want to mention quickly, Jackie Nahler has joined the panel as well. And um, if people do have more questions beyond, you know, just kind of what I presented, but even on the financial side, Jackie is, has done a, a wonderful job and can talk more about the kind of fundraising effort if people are interested. And that concludes my portion of, of the panel, I believe. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so if, if everyone else wants to hop on camera, um, there are a couple that came in on the um, in the Q and A. Um, some of them, I think, a lot of these might be for Olivia, but I think the rest of you might have input as well. Um, one question we got was um, about the timeline, and the question is wondering generally how long will the project cycle be considering the relatively longer pre-design process? Hi, yes, unfortunately, I can't really provide a very good answer to that. Um, and Mike actually might be able to talk about this too because of his experience with non-preservation projects as well. But I will say it's super dependent on what you need from the pre-design and then how big your building is. And then also what the capacity of the architect that you end up hiring is for how quickly it can go. Um, yeah, what do you think, Mike? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, a great, um, you know, synopsis. I mean, for us, just we started in August of 2017, did our building needs assessment. The pre-design was quite a bit of the actual work. And by the time we hired um, uh, Walden, you know, I think they had CDs done in three to four months. And then okay. construction obviously was much further along there. But the pre-design part was the largest part for us. Yeah, I think if, yeah, we think, I think putting time into pre-design is really just the important aspect of it. And then the construction process, the um, construction documentation process could be longer depending on the complexity of the project you choose based on those pre-design studies. Um, I hope that answers the question. Great. Uh, another sort of process question, um, at what point do you usually test for environmental slash dangerous toxins? Yeah, so that's going to be on your front end as well. You're going to have a hazardous materials study. It depends on the era of your building as well when it was built. Um, but, you know, it's, I think, 1970 is the lead paint cutoff. You want to be testing for that and testing for asbestos. And a lot of contractors and even architects will stipulate that that needs to be done before they enter the building to survey it. So you may need to commission that before the in-person assessment of your building happens by the architect or design professional. Um, yes, so early, early. Um, let's see. Uh, when there are applications during construction, is it important to include as-built plans as part of the contract? Modifications during construction, I'm reading the con. Um, you know, as-built plans are always a good idea if you have time and uh, can afford them and the contractor willing to do them, especially because like I was saying, it'll inform your next project. Um, and they can be as informal as markups, you know, with a colored pencil on the final plans that the contractor was doing. Um, but for major modifications during construction, you should try to document those as much as possible. Through. So your contractor may be doing that through like a formal request for information process where you're submitting sketches and drawings. And that should all be laid out. The process for making modifications during construction should all be laid out in your contract for construction with the contractor. Um, the AIA contracts is a great place to look for this too, because they lay out the basic most commonly practiced version of that. Um, yeah. This might be a simple thing as part of that, and it might be my part in not really knowing architectural stuff, but can you explain what as-built plans are compared to the other plans? You might've mentioned that earlier, but it might be good to just reinforce. I don't think I did. I think it's um, basically, it's what actually happened at the end of construction documented in plan. And sometimes it's just like, oh, we actually put the toilet a foot to the left. Um, but other times it's like, no, this entire plan didn't work and we had to redesign it during construction. The reason we do more design and more pre-design is to avoid things like that, right? But it's, if something unknown came up during construction and you had to sort of re-navigate around it, re-navigate, re uh, to get around it and find a new solution, that's when big changes are gonna happen. So as-built plans often will happen after 
the construction is completely finished and you want to go back and, and kind of update the set that you started construction with. Um, I think this is my question for Lovely Lane, um, but Alicia is asking, this may have been said, but is the church a historic landmark for the city? If not, did making a landmark have a place in the conversation for the process? Great question. Um, we actually are a landmark in both the city, state, and on the National Register of Historic Places. So um, we're definitely landmark, but we were landmarked well before this project. However, th there's kind of a, another side story to this that's kind of important, and it came part, uh, part of our uh, rehabilitation story is we partnered with the Maryland Historical Trust, and part of that partnership was a 15-year, I believe, easement on the building, uh, an exterior easement, um, and that enabled us to get some grant monies for some of the window restoration work we're doing. Um, and so that, again, that was one of the places where the lawyer on the committee uh, really was, was a big help in, in writing some part of that grant and, and w working us through walking up through what that easement actually meant. Yeah. However, it does not mean that you can just go forward on anything unrelated to your design project if it's going to touch the exterior of the building during the duration of that easement. So it's a partnership for a long term with the preservation advocacy uh, governmental group that I think is in the best interests of the property because it was built for one reason and it's not gonna become condos or whatever, at least during the easement period after the investment of the government agency to keep um, rehabilitation front and center and not repurposing. I love yeah. that that's what you guys had with that too, because a lot of times designation is seen as limitations, but for you, it was opportunity for funding. Right. Yeah. And if you're not, because this is a basics webinar, I also want to say if you're not familiar with easements, um, we have a lot of resources related to this on Preservation Leadership Forum. If you just in the search bar, put easements in and the website for forum is forum.savingplaces.org. We also have a bunch of different stories about recent easements. We put on places like the Nina Simone House and a couple of other places that do a really good job of explaining how valuable they are and why they're um, critical pieces of preservation. It's a preservation tool that um, you should consider if you can. Um, but I'll try and include some of that in the follow-up email to this webinar because I'm talking right now, it'll be hard for me to drop it in the chat. So, um, <laughs> um, and then- There's a quick question about design build that I see there. And actually I have some information about that in the checklist, but generally I don't recommend it for historic buildings unless this design build entity that's combined is really experienced with it um, just because the priorities are not always in line as far as schedule cost between preservation and getting something built really quickly. Um, so the, the answer to a design build question is proceed with caution and check and recheck qualifications um, and make sure you have people experienced with historic properties. And, the, and the, you can't see the Q&A panel because I'm not sure if the audience can, but yeah, uh, there was someone saying, you seem to be saying, do not contract with a design build contractor if they will not separate the two disciplines. Um, kind of what I, that's kind of what I'm saying, but um, it, we've, I've seen it work and I've seen it really not work. So. <laughs> and then we have this perfect timing. We have one more question mm -hmm. uh, and you might not be able to answer them here, but we can also collect and put it in the, um, recording list afterwards. But um, I may have missed this, but do you know of any funding sources or grants for pre-construction assessments since they can be costly? There are sources. I think National Trust has our preservation funds are a great source for assessments. Um, and you can find that on Preservation Leadership Forum and we can drop that in. Yeah, and um, it's the link I posted earlier about where you sign up for updates. That's also where all the information about National Trust grants are as well. Um, so it's basically forum.savingplaces.org. And um, if you go to the build tab, uh, it'll there'll be a button that says find funding. I recommend that folks take a look to see if their local government is a certified local government because in many states, they'll also have planning grants available uh, to folks to do some of that project planning. We also took advantage of a $5,000 grant from National Trust for our um, pre-planning BNA study. 
we also include a $5,000 planning grant you know, with the national funds. So um, we, we see the value of that um, with our program and hopefully other funders will also get on board. I'm not sure, maybe, maybe someone on the panel knows if the Getty is still doing their planning grants as well. I'm not sure, but they, they kind of focus more on modern things these days, but it may be helpful for someone in, in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple of closing things. Um, is, there are no more questions, so we're just going to go ahead and close this out. Um, so first, I'm going to hit enter on this chat. <laughs> um, so there's actually a number of ways for you to keep talking. Um, Forum Connect is our online community. It's free and open to everyone. Um, and so feel free to join. I am actually the community manager, so you'll see my name all over the place. Um, but um, welcome. Please join us. Um, then we also have a variety of um, webinars going forward. Well, we're forum webinars, we're sort of in planning for the fall. We do have these three pass forward pre conference workshops. Um, they're 90 minutes long, they're going to be great. Um, Rhonda, who's been running the slideshow, is the one who's been organizing it, and they've got an amazing group of people on it. Uh, the registration links are um, on Preservation Leadership Forum, but they're also on the conference website which I'm just posting a whole bunch of links for you to try and save real quick. Um, but I'll also include this in the follow-up email to everyone as well. But we hope you will join us for that and the conference because early bird registration is open right now. Um, and finally, thank you for joining us today. We're really glad that you were able to come. I hope it was useful. Um, like I said, I'll be sharing all the information in the follow-up email. Please fill out the survey that pops up when you sign off. And thank you to Olivia, Allison, Michael and Jacqueline for joining us uh, today. Um, and if you need to reach us, we are at forum at savingplaces.org. Um, thank you. <laughs>